All right, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Rajanta Hodges Mills. I'm a therapist, diesel therapeutic counseling and consulting. Um, I love what I do. Um, I do purposeful work. Um, I'm in the field just because of different reasons. Most importantly, um, I would say environmental reasons, um, just wanting to do better for my community. Um, also, just, you know, just. Okay, I messed up. I messed up. All right, so we're watching the episode of Trend Talks. Um, I'm here with the professional from my city, and I just felt like, you know, we need more influential women role models, you know, especially in, um, in today's time. I felt like you would be a great episode, someone to highlight a, a great story to hear from, and you said you're okay. even from this area. I'm Frazier Holmes. Born in the project, the original project shit. Born in the projects, yes, yes. So tell me, tell me your story. How do you go from that to this? Tell me. Um, I was born in the projects, um, Fraser Homes. You know, li lived with my grandmother, my mom, my sister, my uncle. So we all lived in a three bedroom apartment um, in the projects. And I would say that I guess the things I saw I thought was normal. You know, back in the day, people smoked crack in the '80s. You see the crack bombs with the, you know, the red tips just all around lining the sidewalks. Um, there wasn't like a lot of violence. Um, there was a lot of drug use, um, even from people, you know, within my family. So I want to say I kind of always knew that I wanted to do things different. And I didn't know what that meant at that time. Like, what does different mean when you're in this situation and this is all you know? Um, hopelessness, um, despair. But I, what I will say, even though I grew up, I would say below the poverty line. I mean, bread and butter for dinner, poverty lines. I mean, washing your clothes in a bathtub, poverty line. Um, I will say that through that, I just know that I, I knew that I wanted more, right? So what I will say about my mother, um, she kind of kept us into different programs that can really steer us into different um, opportunities, right? So we went to Catholic school growing up um, before, you know, we, after that we went to, you know, to public schools, but we went to Catholic school. Uh, we were involved in like Project Smile, um, Upper Bound programs and different just things to kind of give us what my mother could not give us. My mom was young too, you know, so she had us when she was younger, teenager. So she had two kids by the time she was 19. She was the baby. Um, so she really couldn't only pour in us what she had. And that wasn't that much, but she pointed us in the direction to where we could get the resources that we need. Um, my father was also incarcerated throughout my life. So... And not making excuses, but just really giving him grace. Um, he was incarcerated, but I will say that his family always looked out for me, right? Um, I actually, that was the, the only man I did a bit was my dad. I remember going to jail to see him, you know, throughout my years, you know, writing him and diff different things like that. And I guess also um, drug use as well. So my dad was an IV drug user that also ended up contracting HIV, right? So that was kind of like my life. You know, um, growing up with those things, um, making wrong decisions, um, just having people in my life that I didn't, that didn't deserve my time, but also learning the lessons that came with it and really learning my worth. I think that was something that um, really kind of pushed me through um, and gave me like the courage I need to really step out on faith. So I think that I'm definitely a product of prayer. I had a very religious family. Uh, my grandmother was an evangelist. My mom kind of kept us in church. I mean, real Pentecostal type church. I mean, prayer caps and like stockings and slips, that type of thing. Um, going to revivals, going to church Friday nights, Sunday school, and then after that, going to church after that, and then evening services. So I would say that was something that really, um, I guess, gave me a balance and also gave me just a foundation, um, compassion that I have, um, empathy that I have, you know. Um, not saying I didn't get caught up. I got caught up. Um, I always, um, but I always, I think, had faith. And I think faith pushed me through. Um, in addition to, like, my praying grandmother, who I believe still prays for me from the grave, or my praying ancestors who really got me here. Because, I mean, where I am now, like, I don't see how I got to where I am with all of the um, barriers that were put up in front of me. I was a young mom. I was a teenage mom. I had my daughter when I was 17. Um, but I would say prayer, prayer, um, uh, motivation, um, and, and, and more prayer. Like my family really prays for me. 
um, in a way that really, I guess, still carries me to this day. Wow. I got to let a lot of that soak in. That's, that's a deep story. Um, think about, let's, let's talk about where you are now for, for where they don't know, for those who don't know. Okay, so Let's where I am now. Make it full circle. So, um, right now, um, I'm a licensed therapist. Um, I currently supervise a, a unit in the psych ward. Um, and I also have my own private practice, uh, which I love. Um, and I guess, when you think about therapy, um, people think that, you know, if you go to therapy, that means you're crazy. Um, so there's a lot of different stigmas that kind of come along with therapy that kind of really makes people kind of... Um, stay away from it, stay away from it. But what I've been seeing now, which is so great, is that people that look like me who are kind of reaching out for help, um, reaching out, you know, really wanting to kind of really continue their healing journey, which is so important because we walk around hurt. We walk around with just all these different things and baggage that really kind of carries us from one phase of our life to another. So I just think when people are able to kind of receive, you know, what's for them um, and see that there is more to life than just hurt, um, being in pain, um, I think that it's like it's, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So if I can help somebody get there, um, that's what, that's my goal all the time. Um, representation matters. It's important to see people that look like you who have been through your same struggles. You know, because you know when I see my clients, you know, certain things they say to me, I know they're not crazy. This is just a regular day in the hood. You know, so um, it's really really important to um, have people around you that support you. And if you can have somebody with you who kind of have had that similar walk, it is amazing and it is incredible. So, yeah, that's what I do in a nutshell. How did your upbringing connect you to wanting to become a therapist? Um, I, I, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. Um, but I will say, me having my daughter young, right? Um, and I will say that you know, I had my daughter, I was pregnant. I walked across the stage, 12th grade, with a seven months pregnant with a belly. Okay? And I was one of those girls who was like, you know, oh, she's pregnant, she's pregnant. So it happened to me, too. Right? So just really not wanting to be a statistic um, really kind of pushed me forward. Um, I remember in 12th grade working two jobs in 12th grade. So I worked two jobs, um, did my own baby shower. You know, I was saving for the stuff for my baby, my daughter, Jayla. I remember I had a journal, and I would be writing things, everything she needed in it. So when I got my check, I went up to Kmart, got my stuff, you know, and um, that really, it really pushed me. Um, I started working in the hospital. That was my first job. My thing was I did not want to be on welfare. So I was like, okay, even though this is my circumstance, how can I get out the circumstance? I've always been a problem solver. Um, I can make a dollar out of 15 cents, okay? I, I can really, really make it work. Um, and I think that's something that's been beneficial because um, my persistency, uh, my, my commitment. I'm not the smartest person, but my drive, my drive really carries me far. Um, but getting back to that, so I had a baby, right? Worked at a hospital around these people who didn't look like me, right? Um, and I wouldn't say they, looking, they were looking down at me, but, I mean, they didn't understand me either. Here I was, 18 years old, with a little baby, you know? Um, so I said, well, maybe I want to go and be a physical therapist assistant, you know, because this is what they were doing. I didn't know. I didn't have any real guidance. Um, that didn't work for me, because that means I would have to work, go to school full time. I couldn't go to full school full time because I had a baby. I had to work. So then I saw these addiction classes. So I said, you know what? Maybe I'm going to try this. I'm going to try these classes at Mercer County. I'm going to see if it works for me. And I know a lot about addiction. Right? I'm, I'm from, you know, the urban areas. I know I've seen it. I've experienced it. I started taking these classes and found out it was really something different. Um, I became interested in it, kept on pursuing it. Um, my first job was in the prisons. So I did a lot of work in the prisons with a lot of people who are um, socially justice impacted. Um, that kind of started my career. That started my career. I uh, worked with the Juvenile Justice Commission. I worked there um, with the kids who became my kids. You know, came my sons, you know, those are my first sons before I had my son. Um, I worked there for a couple of years and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but I will say that I was not ready. I was, I was 21 when I started doing that. 21. I bought my first house when I was 21 too. So my drive, not my smarts, my drive and my persistency kind of really pushes me. 
Um, that experience taught me how to deal with people, um, how to not deal with people, how to be empathetic, um, how to be more nurturing. Um, when I left, because of childcare issues, I cried. I cried like a baby because like I was leaving my kids, you know, but I really needed to find something more stable because I had childcare issues and things like that. And, you know, my priorities was just trying to be, you know, um, a decent mom, you know, worked the welfare for 10 years. Now they raised me. They actually raised me. I were, that's my first time being around like really professional people who really pushed me. And even listen, when I say I used to go out on a work night, right, I would go on a work night. Come home, they shout me, get up and go to work in the morning. They like pull me to the side and listen, you know, do this, this, and this. So they taught me so much working there. Um, and actually, they paid for me to finish school too. So I ended up finishing school. Um, I took my, finished my classes, um, got my bachelor's degree while I was there, um, ended up getting certified, become the certified alcohol and drug counselor. Um, and I said, okay, sky's the limit. Sky's the limit from there. Um, went back to Juvenile Justice Commission. I worked there three, three times. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and, you know, then, you know, I met someone there, Sonella, shout out to her. She was an intern there. She actually encouraged me. She was getting her license in counseling. She encouraged me to get my master's degree. So um, we started, stopped, started, stopped, started, stopped. And, you know, I finally finished. And, you know, the rest is history. I ended up, you know, upgrading my licensure um, and just, you know, finding this space. Like, okay, well, this is important. Um, and it's important because of the access to services that people don't get, um, the discouragement that people get when they are turned away, or the judgments people get, and um, even with my experiences with therapy. So uh, when I had my second child, I experienced postpartum depression. When, when I say I was depressed, like I could not work depressed. And, and, and aside from me having a no good husband, that's a whole other thing, right? But I could not work, so I actually ended up you know, going to therapy. Um, and I want to say it was life changing for me. It really changed my life, you know, in a way that, and this is back before it was popular. So this is about 2010. So people thought I was crazy. This is back before it wasn't like, um, you know, people weren't on their wellness journey back then. It was like, okay, you want to therapy? You, you, something, wrong, something wrong with you. It was like whispers about it. It was still a lot of stigma. Right. But um, it was, it was life changing. It was, it really changed my life. It opened me up. Um, I met great people. Um, I had great therapists. Um, I don't know where I would be without it. I don't know where I would be without it, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it. So that kind of really started my wellness journey way back when. This is my son is be 13, so this is 13 years ago when I kind of really propelled. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about your private practice, okay. the name. Okay. And, you know. So um, my private practice is called Diesel Therapeutics um, Counseling and Consulting. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. I'm also a certified clinical supervisor, which means when people are seeking licensure, I provide that supervision that they need so they can, um, I can sign up for their paperwork and they can kind of um, go through the state and get their licensure. So now in order to be a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, you need somebody to sign up for your paperwork, which would be me. You know, um, I provide clinical hours as well, where I provide training, I provide guidance, so people can kind of get the skills they need to get licensed. Um, I also um, help people start their private practices as well. So I've helped people start their own businesses and private practices. Um, it's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. And I also feel like people have kind of helped me, mentored me, you know, and didn't have to take a chance on me, you know, so I try to give back in that way of kind of helping people along their journey as well, uh, in which they have also been successful as well. Um, right now I'm on several platforms, you can find me on Psychology Today, I'm on Mental Health Match, I'm on Alma, um, I take most insurances, I also take Medicaid now, um, and I also take Medicare now. So I offer telehealth, um, all virtual services, um, I implement like a, just a creative approach. Um, so it's not just you sitting in front of your laptop or your phone just talking. So we do worksheets. Um, I'm very goal-oriented in what I do. Um, so my clients, they learn coping skills each time they meet with me. Um, I'm relatable as well. I come from a space where I'm not judgmental because everybody has their own issues. Um, everybody has a different walk. And you never know what people went through to kind of get where they are. Like everybody has a story. 
Uh, we're so quick to really judge people and where they come from, but you don't know that person could have been suicidal yesterday. Or that person may have experienced a loss, uh, may have struggled with addiction, may have been sexually assaulted. You know, so we all have our different traumas. You know, it's just like, okay, whether we want to address those traumas or not. And some traumas are too difficult, you know, um, for you to even address at that moment. But just being able to um, have a safe space, to be able to talk to somebody about it, uh, and process it, even the uncomfortable emotions that come with it is very, very important. So it's like, how bad do you want to heal? Like, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want to heal? Mm -hmm. That's deep. Um, did you ever feel like, you know, because I had time periods in my life where I would have memories from childhood or middle school mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe even mm -hmm. high school pop up like in adulthood mm -hmm. and I was looking it up and it was like, this is somewhat normal and mm -hmm. where you have repressed memories, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in inner city um, environments. Yes. Um, yes. How do you, how, why would you recommend dealing with repressed um, Well, memories? I mean, I would say, you know, growing up in, in, in different environments, um, especially the urban environments for me, it was, you know, saw a lot of violence, saw people get jumped, stomped out, you know, I never forget that I was caught out in a shootout. OK, um, so I've been through different things and even just different um, things related to trauma. That's triggering, like not having this. And I'm very, very tight with my money just because growing up, we didn't have money. You know, we had to go to the store with food stamps and cash the food stamps. In order. They didn't have EBT back then. It was just food stamps out the book, you know. Um, so just growing up that way and just thinking about that. I think that sometimes, you know, I think about that. Now, even the way I live my life. You know, I'm frugal with certain things. Now, I, all I need is good food, and I'm fine. But I'm frugal with a lot of other things. My mom said, why are you, why are you so tight? Like, why are you so tight? I'm like, I'm tight because of this was, this was my experience, and I don't want to go back to where I was before. You know, who wants to really go back and struggle and suffer and not have enough money for lunch or, you know, not have a bus ticket to get to school or not have clean clothes to wear or not even, you know, have, have food to eat? You know, those type of traumas, you know, it really carries us and it really impacts us. It doesn't have to define who you are. You know, you process it and move forward, but you can kind of use that as a strength to kind of propel to where you want to be. Right? My mom never owned a house. You know, um, my grandma never owned a house. My grandma lived and died in the projects. You know, um, so just different, those different things kind of propel me to like, okay, I want better. And it's like, and once you see that you can achieve those different things, like you kind of, you know, I mean, I started investing in real estate as well. I, um, I bought my first rental property when I was seven months pregnant in the process of leaving my ex-husband. You know, um, the sky's the limit. And, you know, I think what's for you is for you. You know, the key is just persistency, um, consistency, um, and also just the confidence. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I was a C student. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Coming from the projects, so to speak, um, how do we like use it for when we need it mm -hmm. and not become stuck there? Um, I think it's all it's mentality, but I also think if, if you don't, if you haven't seen more, like how would you know? Right, um, we didn't have a car growing up, so it's like it's in different parts of Trent. I never knew existed, you know, just because I'm in that square. So from the projects, my mom moved out to East Trent Road Street. So we moved to North Clinton, um, where I kind of grew up and experienced a lot of childhood memories, both good and bad. Um, but we didn't have a car, so we caught the bus. The bus only take you to certain places, certain parts of Trent you can't get to on the bus. So with certain streets, I didn't even know, you know, because we didn't have a car. Um, being around people who inspire. I watch a lot of documentaries, you know, because it kind of puts me in that space. I also watch a lot of travel channels because I'm like, wow, you know, it kind of makes me feel like sky's the limit. It kind of broadens my horizon um, and teaches me that there's more than just this, you know, but when you're in it and you're in the thick of things and the struggle, you don't know. But I mean, it's, it's, it's more to it. Definitely keeping people in your, around your circle who are inspiring. Uh, people who are driven and people who really want uh, more in life. Like, you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the one in the in crowd. You don't have to be none of that. You know, you just have to really stay focused and stay um, persistent. All right. So tell, tell them how they can get in contact with you. 
and your social media is it <laughs> listen because i'm so busy <laughs> i am on facebook um diesel therapeutics um counseling uh, i'm on facebook i'm on instagram too but my page is not popping because listen i i'm a dinosaur i'm a dinosaur we're gonna still fix trying. that <laughs> so because i'm so busy um i really don't have time to pour into it like i like i want to um, I'm blessed. My private practice is doing well. I'm in the process of getting a waiting list. I actually just hired one person. So I'm really, um, I'm blessed. Um, I've been doing a lot of community outreach too. So you see me in the community, say hi. Um, I wave back. You know, I've been doing a lot of things with the, with um, collaborations with different organizations. Just, just get the word out there, out there that it's okay to heal. So you may see me in the community. Um, also, I'm on Alma. Um, so like I said, Psychology Today. Um, and you can also call me as well, email me, dieseltherapeuticsllc at gmail.com. Um, I definitely get back to you um, quickly. Right. Well, there you have it. From the projects to a private practice. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the title. <laughs>